Hello, everybody. We're just about to start. Um, it's pretty exciting here. We have um, a, a fantastic speaker, um, and uh, she is going to give a great presentation about cannabis food safety. Uh, just, I mean, just a few, few couple years ago, this would never have been a conversation. But uh, now, now we're really going to be talking about cannabis food safety, and a multitude of states, more than half of them now, um, have cannabis at least on a medical level, and uh, our guest today was one of the first inspectors for cannabis in Colorado, which was one of the first places. Um, we're going to be starting up this presentation very soon. We still have people joining up here. And so we're going to give about 30 seconds and then we're going to start back up. We're going to let, let uh, uh, Kim go with, with her great presentation. And, and I know a lot of people are really excited about this. Um, if you have any questions at all, go ahead and put them in the chat box. And we're going to be, uh, as this conversation goes, to be a little different. We're not going to just have Kim go through the whole entire presentation and then ask questions at the end. We're actually going to be asking the questions as Kim is giving the presentation. So I'm going to be keeping track of all of your questions in the chat box and uh, try to keep them you know, going kind of fluid through there. We'll also ask some more questions at the end. So you'll have some time if, if, if you if you missed your question um, as she's going through uh, the subject. So we still have some people joining. Um, again, those of you who, who have just joined us, we have uh, Kim Stuck. She is a professional in cannabis um, as an original inspector for Colorado. Uh, Kim, how many states now allow medical cannabis? Oh, now we're up to like 28, I believe. 28. Uh, yeah, um, Oklahoma actually, I think, was the last one to sign off on it. So, yeah, I mean, there might be actually more than that now, but I think I think we're up to 28 or 29. Um, so a lot of a lot of places and a lot of um, countries as well. Ireland just signed on for medical cannabis. The entire country, um, Puerto Rico's going, and obviously Canada now too. So it's it's getting big. <laughs> Wow, 28. God bless federalism. Now now if we can just get uh, sessions out of the way, we'll be able to have it federally, right? Yeah, fingers crossed. I guess the Congress too. I guess this is an act of Congress as well. But um, So those of you just joining, we're, we're, we're adding more and more and more here. Um, we're just about to start. Um, if you have any questions at all, this, this is going to be a little bit different than, than, than usual. We're not going to have Kim just give her whole entire presentation and then ask questions at the end. She, uh, loves to have a dialogue. And so we're going to be having this going as a dialogue. So if you have any questions at all, just go ahead and ask the questions in the chat box and, uh, I'll be keeping track of that and, and be asking those questions as, as we go through here. Okay. So Kim. We're going to start now, um, and so we'll just kind of let's let's go through who you are. Awesome, um, and I think I actually have a slide that kind of says goes over stuff if we want to. So essentially, uh, so this entire um, entire webinar is based on um, food safety. Oh, we went too far. Um, but um, I actually was uh, one of the first uh, inspectors in Denver for um, food safety uh, in Denver or for cannabis. Um, there were inspectors that actually went in, food inspectors that went into some of these dispensaries and stuff in the beginning. Um, but I was actually the first one with the marijuana specialist title. So um, I was the first inspector to only have cannabis on my plate. Um, and in Denver, um, that was over three or 1,600 ish licenses um, at that time. So, I mean, there were a lot of places that I was going into. So I got to see a lot of things that most people don't see. Um, and because we were running into new uh, formulations and different products that nobody had ever seen before, um, I got to help with a lot of like the regulations and a lot of the rules around uh, the food safety side of cannabis. So my background, um, obviously working for Denver, um, it was really, really awesome working there. It's an amazing department. Um, those people are very, very open-minded. Obviously they jumped into cannabis. Um, I was a, a restaurant health inspector before I took on the cannabis side. So I have a lot of training in just general food safety, um, and including wholesale production as well. 
Um, in my career, I've disposed of millions and millions of dollars worth of cannabis and cannabis products due to um, non-compliance in, you know, issues with their food safety. A lot of times they wouldn't have sinks or, you know, uh, were putting things in their products that weren't supposed to be there and things like that. So um, what was your nickname? I love this. What was your nickname? Oh, the weed whacker. <laughs> they still actually call me that in Denver. <laughs> um, I'll go to happy hours every once in a while and have people come up to me. Oh, are you the weed whacker? And I'll be like, yes, I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I founded Allay Consulting, which is just a, a consulting, a compliance consulting uh, firm. And it's really, I don't know, it's really great. I've been doing that for a little over a year now, and it seems to be going well. So um, I also teach at some cannabis universities. I'm on some advisory boards. Um, I'm a member of the National Cannabis Industry Association, um, and I'm on the Cannabis uh, Sustainability Council in Denver. So that's my background. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and, and ask, and I will answer. Great. All right. So why don't you control the slides? You can go to the next one. Okay. Because we don't – they – Get kind of messed up, guys. So I'm yeah. Sorry. And by the way, um, uh, we've had some more people join since since she started introducing herself. So please enter in the chat any questions that you have, and we're going to answer those questions as we go through um, as we go through the presentation. Awesome. Well, um, I was told to kind of talk about a few things that I've run into: um, contamination, ingredient sourcing, um, that kind of thing. So the first thing I'm Gonna briefly, you know, kind of go over is contamination. Um, a lot of um, cannabis is really different than other um, foods, and I didn't realize this when I was getting involved. I mean, I knew it was different, but I didn't realize how different and to what scale. So, um, in even the grows, um, every plant is considered a food. So even in the on the grow level, um, everything has to be treated in a way um, as if it's a wholesale food manufacturer. So um, that was not something that I was expecting. I was expecting it to be just like a, you know, a Lay's potato chip company where you go in and you see the processes and you evaluate and that's what you do um, and walk away. But really, um, every product goes all the way back to the grow. So everything in the production facility came from somewhere and you need to evaluate where it came from in order to make sure that the product is a safe product. Um, so the way that you build a facility is really, really huge. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you come from a food safety background. So you've probably been in a lot of kitchens, a lot of wholesale food manufacturing um, and have a lot of um, food safety protocols in place. Um, but when you walk into an agricultural <laughs> building, it's a lot different. Um, and that's where food safety has to start is in the grows. Um, so the way that they're built, um, there's a lot of mold issues, there's pest issues. Um, and then there's, you know, obviously contaminants like hair and skin and, you know, clothing and those kinds of things that you have to worry about as well. Um, so when you're building a facility is, is kind of where it all starts. So when you start with, um, you know, building your facility, you have to think of, okay, are we going to put all the mom plants, which are the plants that have cuttings that all your clones come from, do you put those in the front of the building so you have to walk by them every time um, you have to leave the building or whatnot? And that's, you know, not necessarily the best way to set up um, a grow. So there's a lot of people who specialize in building grows, and I actually do that as well. But um, but yeah, it's like a whole can of worms to even open to talk about how to build a grow. But you have to think about that in the kitchens as well. And I'm sure you guys are probably pretty used to that, you know, understanding less steps, um, going through less doors to get into different areas, those kinds of things. So you have to kind of take your food safety knowledge and apply it to places that you don't usually apply it to, at, such as a grow. So th I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are some of the biggest issues in contamination that you're seeing right now um, throughout the whole entire process? So growing, processing, um, uh, creating, you know, candy or retailing or whatever. Where are you seeing some of the biggest contamination issues? 
So first of all, first of all, in the grows, um, mostly because of either soil contaminants or front or like mold contaminants um, or pesticide contaminants. There's so many different things that can happen um, when growing cannabis that I mean, there's stuff coming at you from all different ways. So um, there there are times that people are spraying cannabis with illegal pesticides. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times it's not the owner that even knows that it's happening. It's on the grower level um, or they have bought a facility that is already contaminated with pesticides. And therefore, you know, even if you move in clean plants, those plants get contaminated as well because of the environment. Um, and then obviously molds are a really big issue. PM, which is powdery mildew, is one of the biggest issues in cannabis, um, especially here in Colorado, because it's everywhere. Um, we have PM on our sidewalks in Colorado. So, um, and it's, it's not a very dangerous mold, but it does affect yield and it certainly affects the look of the plant. So, um, and can cause other things to be able to be harbored in that plant after it's already contaminated. So let's talk about pesticides real quick, because I know a lot of people that are that are in this webinar right now are farmers and food safety people. And they're like, how can pesticides be legal when so much of the pesticides are regulated by the EPA, et cetera? And this is a, a federally illegal uh, substance. How are even how are farmers utilizing pesticides and, and where do they know what to do with pesticides? Because I know that's been one of the biggest contaminants in the cannabis side, just kind of watching this uh, unfold over the last couple of years. And so uh, is pesticides a huge issue and, and, and what's going on with that right now? Yeah, so actually most of the, the uh, plants that I've disposed of in my career were due to pesticide contamination. So each state has its own Department of Agriculture. So regardless right. of whether the EPA is watching or not, there is a regulatory body. Um, but unfortunately, in the beginning, um, nobody thought about pesticides as being an issue. And the issue is, um, you know, because pesticides are used in all kinds of things. You can you spray microbutanol, and I'm just using that as an example. Um, it's illegal to use on cannabis, but it's legal to use on berries and apples and ornamental plants and these kinds of things. So it's used very widely in agriculture. Um, the issue that we've ran into from a public health standpoint um, is when cannabis is so much different. So when you harvest cannabis, you're not only putting those in edibles because we have organs that, you know, detoxify our system. When we eat something poisonous, we can handle, I think it's 0 0.02 parts per million. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But it's a lower level of microbutanol that would be on, let's say, an apple. When you eat that apple and ingest it, you know, you have your liver and your kidneys and all these other organs that are fighting against that toxin to get it out of your body. With cannabis, we're taking that plant and we're not only putting it in edibles, and I'm gonna get weird here, but we're putting it in suppositories and tampons and nasal sprays and vape pens that we're inhaling into our lungs that go directly into our bloodstream. And so because of all those different ways of entry, it has to be treated a different way. Um, We've done studies for years and years and years about these different pesticides being eaten, and we've come up with thresholds that are safe. Right now, we have no thresholds for what is safe for when you inhale something or wow. something else. Yeah, so cannabis. Or, is, or something else. Yeah, or something you can think like 30 different that. ways. I was like, whoa. <laughs> this is what's wow. sold. If you go into a dispensary, and I urge everyone to at least go into one if they are able um, and just check it out because there's so many different things. Um, this industry is coming up with new ideas constantly. Um, and so everything has to be treated in a different way. Um, and it, I don't know, we have to err on the side of caution when it comes to food safety because now we're not treating it as edibles. We're treating everything as a consumable. So if it's going wow. into your body through any way, <laughs> that is, you know, that has to be held to a higher standard than wow. just something yeah so how how um where i mean the pesticide thing now has become very very interesting um where are 
who's who's regulating this? So if it's each individual state, and now you're saying there's 29 different states that are that are um, allowing this for medical purposes. So now we know that you know there's a recreation side that a few states are doing this on, but on a much broader scale, sick people are now utilizing cannabis as a medicine. And um, obviously with, with, with six people, no, we know in the food safety world that they're more apt to have issues. And um, are, are each of these states, do they have boards that are looking at and communicating with states that have already enacted what pesticides are stay, safe? And are there people doing studies on this? Um, uh, what's going on with that? Well, it really depends on what area you're in. Um, because different states all have different laws. And in fact, each county within that state has different laws as well. Um, so it's, it gets really, really complicated um, to tell you where everybody is at. Um, but one of the issues that I very loudly speak out about um, is in most counties, um, the state health departments have kind of stepped back. Um, I would say Oregon and California, they're doing pretty good. Um, and they're getting involved in putting, you know, certain things in, in order, if you will, um, and into law. But a lot of other states, especially in the medical states, there aren't any health departments who are actually regulating edibles, um, unfortunately. Mostly it's a money issue. Um, you know, they don't have enough people to keep up with, with all the places that are opening. Um, you know, they just don't have the bandwidth to handle it or they don't have the education. Um, so a lot of these counties or these states, you know, they know nothing about cannabis and they're just going to send their regulators in there like randomly to check out these places, even though they know nothing about cannabis. That's a really scary thing to do. I should know it was really scary for me when I did it. Um, but you just kind of have to do it. Um, but yeah, I that's one of the things that really bothers me, um, I think, in this industry is that most of the edibles on the shelves that I see in most states are not regulated at all. They've never seen a health inspector. Um, most of them have no idea what food safety regulations are, FDA regulations are. Um, most of them don't even have enough hand sinks to be able to be to be able to be producing these products. Um, there are some really great companies out there that have gone, you know, above and beyond and have hired someone that has an FDA background or you know, something like that to try to keep their food safety really good because they care about their consumers. Um, but for the most part, the, the government isn't really stepping in all the way to make sure that these regulations are in place. Um, I think when it goes federal, it'll be a lot different because then the FDA will have some say and they'll be able to go into these places and really check them out and try to get, you know, figure out a, a level that they need to be at. So, yeah. um, but right now it's, it's kind of iffy. <laughs> it's so, so the states are using this as just a profit center without any type of um, actual oversight. Because, I mean, states are making a lot of money on this. Um, we, yeah. we see the uh, – and so they're just – instead of actually really putting the cost – I shouldn't say the cost. Instead of actually putting the investment in of regulating these um, new entities – uh, at the rate at which they probably should, they're just using this for education and general uh, expenses of the states and, and, and kind of letting it be like an anarchy? Well, right now, I mean, I think at the beginning, um, you know, they couldn't, they didn't have the money because they hadn't started collecting the money yet. So they right. couldn't hire, you know, so now I feel like a lot more places are coming on board. That's why I'm so proud um, to be from Denver uh, cause that was the minute it became regulated or the minute it became legal, we, had, we sat down and figured out a way to regulate it. Um, but unfortunately my jurisdiction didn't go outside of Denver County. And so the other counties in Colorado have been kind of up in the air for a really long time. Um, I, you know, there are other factions that have come on board. Boulder County is, you know, Larimer County is getting involved. Um, and it's happening slowly. And I think it is because some of that money is coming in. Um, then they can allocate it correctly and like hire people because it does take a while to hire people and that kind of thing. Um, but it has been a really slow onboarding. And yeah, for the most part, um, a lot of it is just kind of anarchy right now. And people are just crossing their fingers that nothing um, really bad happens. So my wow. fingers are also crossed. But now at least I'm out there making a little bit of a difference 
trying to help people. So, so I have a couple questions here on this, and then we'll move forward to the next slide. Uh, um, uh, one question was, aren't medical facilities under more strict regulations? And so I, 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 I that assumes there are medical facilities. I don't think there are cannabis medical facilities, right? There, um, no, there are medical dispensaries, yes, yeah. and medical grows um, that only pertain to medical. And when I say medical, you have to have a medical card in order to buy um, from those facilities. And it's usually yeah. a much higher <laughs> THC level. Uh, it's funny too. One of my friends in college was like uh, 20 years old and, and uh, got a medical card for glaucoma. I was like, whoa, this is really strict here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's not that hard to get a medical card, but um, then again, you know, now it's recreational in most, in a lot of places. So I think they've kind of figured out it's not going to be killing anyone um, anytime soon. But yeah, actually, um, which is, which is a really funny thing that you brought up. Medical um, grows were actually, they they were less regulated than recreational in the beginning. Um, in fact, they have to go to much lower standards. They didn't even have to do mold or yeast and mold testing for the longest time, wow. which to me was completely crazy because it's a medical thing. You know, you would think that if it's medicine, it would be held to higher standards but it actually was completely the opposite for a really long time. Now they've kind of evened that out, at least in Colorado, um, they've evened that out. And now, you know, medical and recreational are, you know, on the same terms. So, but it was really, it used to bother me a lot back in the day. <laughs> Another question is, who decided on the regulation in Colorado? Was it health inspectors who, who decided on it or was it, uh, um, uh, the government, I mean, the government is health inspectors, but like the actual legislation, what, what decided the, the, the regulation in, in Colorado? Well, there's a lot of steps to it. <laughs> there, I mean, that's a really huge question because I don't know all of the details, honestly. Um, but the way that it kind of ended up, you know, I don't know, sifting out is in Colorado, the MED, so Marijuana Enforcement Division, they're the state department that runs cannabis. So they made their own set of regulations. Um, none of their regulations really have to do with health and safety, um, but they kind of leaned on um, the health department for that. The state health department decided not to really get involved for a long time. Now they're starting to kind of get involved at this point. Um, so it was up to the local jurisdictions. So when I worked for Denver County, we all looked at each other and said, we have to do something about this. So we decided to kind of come up with our own regulations. Um, but the way that it worked was we just took our regular food safety regulations for, you know, every restaurant and took those and just applied them to these instances. So a lot of what I did was go in and evaluate the situation. Um, do I think that this is safe? Yeah, what kind of risks are could happen during this process? Um, and we broke it down and then created, you know, regulations based on that. Um, and then the Department of Agriculture was also heavily involved, as you, you know, as it should be. Um, so they came in, especially when the whole pesticide thing came to light, and they also regulate as well. So there's actually several different factions in facilities pretty regularly at this point. So that's really interesting. So I live in El Paso, Colorado County, El Paso C County, Colorado, which is Colorado Springs. And uh, so my county will have a different health uh, regulation than Denver would. Yeah. So at this moment, wow. that's what it goes. <laughs> every wow. county, um, if if your county even has health inspectors going into places. So if, if they're going in, they might have a different way of doing things. Um, but like I said, I mean, FDA regulation is, is straight across the board. I mean, it's if you know it, you know it. Um, and if you're a food safety person, you know food safety. So you just have to apply that knowledge to the situations. And I feel like that's what every local health department is doing right now. Um, so, I mean, it's not it wouldn't be that complicated. But, you know, there's different things like shelf stability approvals and sourcing approvals and those kinds of things that different counties require. So you really need to, you know, if you're in those counties and have a cannabis business, I recommend reaching out and, you know, seeing what exactly what they require. So, cause all Great. of them are different. 
All right, well, let's let's, let's move to the next slide because I think uh, we keep getting more questions, but but some of these questions are going to be uh, probably part of the next slide. Okay. Let's see if we can go. It's really slow, so sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so I was asked to talk about ingredient sourcing. Um, this is like one of the biggest things that we ran into and that I still, I literally run into this every single day. I did an audit this morning that I ran into this issue. Um, and it's about ingredient sourcing. And as you know, I'm sure all of you know, um, because it sounds like most of you are in the food safety realm, you know, you have to be careful about where you're getting your products from. If you're, you know, baking cookies and you buy flour and, you know, you have to keep a batch number and make sure that, you know, if there's salmonella in that flour, you need to be able to recall it on, you know, keep track of everything so you can recall it if you need to. Um, that is something that is greatly lacking in the cannabis world. Um, a lot of people don't even keep batch numbers, don't even know where um, different, you know, a uh, CBD isolate, for instance, is coming from, where it's going to, and those kinds of things. So that's something that I work on, you know, very, very hard with all of my clients. Um, CBD is is one of those things that um, is uh, kind of the thorn in the side of the food industry right now, uh, mostly because, you know, there's cannabis CBD from marijuana, like THC, you know, and that's in a grow that has a license and everything. Um, CBD is a cannabinoid that is from industrial hemp. Every plant, every cannabis plant has some CBD and some THC, but industrial hemp is much different because it has less than 0.3% THC. So it's very, very low, but has very high um, levels of CBD, which is, you know, CBD is known for, you know, doing great things in cancer and it's good for your immune system. And, you know, it has all these like medical applications that people want um, and it doesn't get you high. So that is, you know, that's a big seller because a lot of people don't want to get high, but they want the medical benefits of cannabis. So people are growing industrial hemp and the grows themselves. Um, you just have to register with the local agricultural department which is online, uh, it doesn't take much <laughs> to do, it takes about five minutes. Um, and then they're unregulated completely, um, especially at least in Colorado. There are other states are starting to implement different things, um, but in Colorado, we're running into the issue of um, they're, they're unregulated. So you can have an entire kitchen that's creating CBD oil and putting it into edibles and sending these out to people and there's no licensing there's no sourcing, there's no, you know, food safety, there's no nothing. Like there isn't any regulators with eyes on this place at all. Um, and to this, or at least to me, that's a little terrifying. Um, and also these CBD companies are selling CBD to THC companies as an ingredient. Um, so we kind of had to go through a big process in Denver to really find out if these CBD companies are making this oil in a safe facility? You know, do they have enough hand sinks? Do they have, are they wearing gloves? Are they touching everything? Are they, you know, do they wear hair nets? Just like things that are common sense to most of us. Um, but a lot of what I do is teaching people how to wash their hands nowadays. So, I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. So, um, but yeah, so that was a huge deal um with cbd does, does anyone have any questions about that oh there are a lot of questions that have just <laughs> opened up <laughs> a lot. Here as well so if anybody wants to reach out <laughs> they're perfectly welcome to and i can try to explain it to you guys we uh, have we have the gamut on this too we have uh people that i know are part of huge beverage companies people that i know are part of huge huge um uh, chains of like uh, uh, 7-Eleven type stores. And uh, so we have we have the gamut. People are very, very interested. And then when you started talking about ingredient sourcing and, and suppliers, man, that's when the floods opened up. So um, one question I thought was, was really, really good. Um, well, I, they're all really good. But, but one in particular that I'm interested in knowing about is – um, what about if someone wants to make like a THC infused 
uh, drink or, or food, THC or CBD infused drink or, or, or food, and they want to sell it to someplace that is legal. Can you do that outside of that state? Um, do you have to do it within that state, within that county? And uh, are there any type of regulatory oversights on some of these, you know, uh, uh, food companies that are creating infused drinks or edibles yeah. and that type of stuff? So it depends. If we're talking, obviously, THC is tracked. So any any cannabis plant that has above 0.3% THC is, is tracked in a system and can only be sold at dispensaries. Um, CBD, on the other hand, uh, it can be sold at a 7-Eleven um, at this point. <laughs> um, it is not technically allowed to cross state lines or international lines. Um, in fact, I have some CBD um, facilities that I work for and they actually have to get a DEA um, it's so funny. It's essentially applying for a registration. So they have a DEA registration in order to sell their CBD to other countries. Um, so you, you can do it, but you just have to do it really above board. Um, it, and it's really hard. It's, it's kind of a pain, honestly. Um, and then, yeah, so CBD, you can literally put it into a beverage. In fact, there's quite a few CBD waters and CBD tinctures. Um, Charlotte's Web just made a huge thing that, I mean, they ended up in Target, but they were making claims. Um, so you have to label it correctly per FDA regulations. Um, you can't claim that it cures cancer or anything like that. Now, Charlotte um, Webb, just to, just to make sure um, to clarify, Charlotte's Webb is the, is the one that got all the news about helping with uh, seizures and stuff, right? It's, yeah, it's a strain yeah. of cannabis. Okay. Yeah. So it's a strain of cannabis, um, but there's also a company called Charlotte's Webb. And they actually had tinctures that were in um, in in Target for a for a short amount of time. Um, really, and then they took them out um, just because of the the FDA the claims that FDA um, were against. Which so you have to label correctly. Obviously, um, they ju I just don't think that they were ready for FDA regulation. Uh, it wasn't part of you know if you don't know about it, you you don't know to do it. I think so. I think eventually we're going to see CBD tinctures and drinks and all of that all over the place. It's just a matter of which brands uh, like 7-Eleven or Walmart or whatever gets brave enough to throw them on the shelves and does their research enough to know that they're a safe company. Um, yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. No, no. Anything with THC theoretically cannot move across state lines, right? No. Because as uh, of interstate commerce clause, right? right. Yeah, so T, anything THC, and honestly, per FDA regulations at this point, um, everything CBD-wise uh, should be staying within state lines. They're not really regulating it. Um, I'm, you know, there are a lot of people that sell CBD online and that kind of thing and ship it, um, but it's not technically legal. So be really so careful. So CBD, like, it, it, okay, so I can go to Costco and buy hemp oil, buy uh, hemp seeds, all that stuff. And we do. It, it's, it's, it's great, right? It's, it's a health food. And hemp seeds come from hemp, which is part of the cannabis plant. Um, so if where are they uh, extracting the C CBD from? Are they extracting it from the, the hemp seeds, from the hemp plant? Um, how, where are they getting this from? Could I just sell my seeds to somebody and then they extract it themselves? How, how does that work? No. So CBD oil is very, very different than hemp oil. So hemp seed oil has no CBD in it at all. Um, the So just like every other plant, there are flowers associated with that plant. And when you see it on, you know, any marijuana plant, it's the big crystally buds, you know, like those things that you see on all the pictures, um, you know, purple and different colors. Um, that's that's where all of your your CBD, THC, every cannabinoid is in those, um, I mean, I could get really deep into it, um, but in, in those trichomes, so the little crystals that are on those plants, on those flowers, um, that's where it all comes from. That's where the magic's made. And so with a industrial hemp plant, they have flowers as well. They just produce more CBD than THC. Um, so it's really from a lot of people just cut them down and do, you know, they extract from the stems and leaves and stalks and in those is the flowers as well. 
So um, you can extract, but it doesn't come from the, the actual seeds, hemp seed oil and hemp hearts and things like that, that you buy um, at, you know, Costco are very, very different than, than a CBD, you know, infused cookie or something like that. Right. So, okay. Um, uh, we get a lot of, uh, there are a lot of questions about like record keeping, cleaning and sanitation and all that stuff for, for suppliers right now. Um, it's not really regulated by anybody, right? The food safety side of the supply chain is not really regulated by anybody. So if I'm a beverage or a processor, um, or an extractor, it, um, am I asking my supply chain are these guys asking their supply chain for any type of food safety type of records and in, in well, anything like that? Yeah, I, I wish. Um, <laughs> but a lot of times, no, because they don't even, a lot of these people that own these companies, they're, they don't have any background in this at all. They don't even have a manufacturing background, a lot of them. Um, so, you know, what I found most of my job um, is explaining these things to, to people and understanding their supply chain um, and then some of the bigger companies. So I work for a couple of bigger companies that actually I, I control all of their food safety um, standards and all of their record keeping and their batch numbers. And, and I actually go and do audits at their suppliers, um, which makes the suppliers really happy. Um, and I will evaluate a company for them to make sure that their supply chain is safe. So it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, there isn't a lot of that. Um, they should be looking into that. And I think the longer that the industry is around, the more and more people are understanding the importance of knowing where all their ingredients are coming from and what's happening to them in root and those kinds of things. You know, if you have CBD oil that hasn't gone through a heat step yet, um, you know, it has to be delivered refrigerated. Are those refrigerated trucks actually working? You know, those kinds of things, even um, people aren't really thinking about that. And it's a little scary, but some of the, you know, more um, in tune companies are really starting to understand that how important that is. So I, I'm seeing a shift, but it's it's a slow shift. So I moved over to the next slide because I thought we were talking more about the standards and this will help answer some of the people's questions. Yeah. Um, I was getting a lot of questions about standards. Where are the standards? Are there any standards? Who's keeping track of, of, of the audits? Are there even any audits? And, um, and I knew that this slide was going to cover a lot of the stuff <laughs> and we're talking about that. So why don't you start to uh, kind of go over the standards right now in terms of food safety for cannabis? So, okay, so with audits, I mean, that's a good place to start. So if your local health department is doing audits, they are keeping track of those audits. Um, and honestly, they should be keeping those records on site. Um, just like a restaurant, you should be keeping your last health inspections for at least six months, um, just for record keeping so that you know, you know, improvements or, you know, that there was an inspection. Um, it's always good, but, you know, just like I said, there are a lot of health departments that aren't getting involved. And, you know, the state health department is too um, busy. I mean, they don't have the bandwidth to go into all of these places. So it's really on the local health departments at this point. I'm sure all of this is going to change eventually. Um, but as of right now, a lot of health departments just aren't regulating. Um, there aren't any standards that are required um, in, and I'm only going to speak to Colorado. And I think this is the same in um, California and Oregon as well. And I think Nevada too, um, they actually are requiring anybody who's working in a manufacturing facility to take a food safety course. Um, and that can be any food safety course as long as it's um, a real course. So either a local health department can teach it, you can do serve safe, you can do, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, online classes work really well. Um, so you know, at least that step has been taken, but a lot of times, you know, that's, as everybody knows, that's not always enough. So, um, yeah, so there aren't really any <laughs> standards as of right now. Um, they're not required to do any ISO stuff. They're not required to um, get certificates of any sort. Um, so there is a huge lack of standards. And it's another thing that, you know, um, is kind of my mission in this industry is to try to, you know, get those standards in place and figure out, you know, what, how, where they should exist, the, the most important places for them to exist. Yeah. So another question right now is, um, 
what do you mean by uh, local health department? Is that county or state? And I think you're saying it's county. It's county. Uh, yeah, it depends on the state. Like, um, I know that California state put out um, a bunch of food safety regulations. Um, they're one of the only ones that are statewide. Um, CDPHE in Colorado hasn't put out any standards yet, um, but local health departments have because they've realized that something needs to happen. Um, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to food safety, a lot of times things like this doesn't, they don't change until something really terrible happens to a community. You know, people die or a whole bunch of people get sick and it's just, you know, a really tragic thing. Um, I think a lot of these local health departments are really stepping up and saying, you know, we're not gonna wait for that. We need to do something now. Um, and, you know, that's commendable. So I'm really glad that some of them are stepping up, but still, I mean, cannabis is an intimidating field to be in. Um, it's, you know, people have a bias against it. They think that it's just a bunch of criminals. Um, they don't want to go into these places. Um, you know, oh, why are we worried about this population? They're just doing drugs. I've literally heard that before. It's terrible. Um, so, you know, we really need to like shift that bias and normalize it more and, you know, make people realize that these are consumers um, and they're part of our community. And if they get sick, you know, that's that's a really big deal. So, yeah. Well, and, and it, is, it is changing. It is completely changing yeah. because um, I just took my family to, to Garden of the Gods. Right. And mm -hmm. while I was in Manitou Springs, my mother in law was like, hey, can you go in there and get me some um, rub? for, you know, like the uh, CBD rub or whatever. And cause she doesn't want to get a medical um, in, in Colorado Springs, by the way, the laws of Colorado Springs is different than Denver, Denver. There's like a, a retail store and right next to every Starbucks in, <laughs> uh, in Colorado Springs is not retail. You can't, you can't get it here in Colorado Springs retail, but you can on medical wise, but it, you know, it's a process or whatever. My mother-in-law doesn't want to do it, but my mother-in-law, uh, is like um, uh, open to using the CBD stuff. So I went in there and picked her up some some rub. But yeah, it's 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 it, the 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 perception. There's definitely a lot, particularly in my county, right, that doesn't legalize it uh, recreationally. The, I I am seeing a lot of the perception change from this being some sort of criminal type of a thing to um, you know people in their seventies. Uh, who who would have been completely against it ten years ago are are now seeing some of the health benefits of it. Uh, at least not, maybe not consuming it, you know, to get high, right. but but utilizing it for the CBD side of, of the medical stuff. So, um, yeah. well, one yeah, of the it's completely changing now is um, the elderly. So right. they actually have um, a nursing home in Colorado that makes a weekly stop at the dispensary for their for their nursing home people. I mean, it's just, it's becoming- <laughs> Like um, a little bus? Right, yeah. Up and, nice. yeah, they need to stop. I actually have a, a client that I was visiting that was telling me that like last month and it was hilarious. Cause I, I look around while I'm doing my audit and there's all these old, old people. <laughs> like I was like, oh my gosh, this whole place is filled with old people. And the um, bud tender told me, yeah, they, they bring them by. <laughs> And I just thought it was so hilarious and amazing. You know, it's it's becoming so much more normalized that the you know the the more senior population is getting involved. And I mean, at this point, from a medical level, even you know children with epilepsy and stuff are you know being able to use it at school and things like that. So it's kind of an interesting world we live in right now. Yeah, and and, and with the right medical thing, it, it, children can even use the THC side of stuff too, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's not just CBD. Yeah, it's low levels, I'm sure, um, because, you know, it's kind of unethical to get your child really, really high. <laughs> but right. I mean, you know, for but on a medical basis, it's usually, you know, really, really high CBD or other cannabinoids and then just a really low dose of THC, especially if there's pain involved with whatever they have or, you know, something like that. So, right. Wow. And so that, that makes the food safety side of things even that much more important, right? Because it's not like it's it's college kids and, and people in their 30s uh, utilizing this anymore. It's, it's, it's the most vulnerable in our society are now utilizing this. Uh, children and, and old people, which are, which are the, the two most at risk of a foodborne illness. 
Well, and also immunocompromised. So people who are right. you know, dealing with heavy cancer um, are now taking THC to right. keep, you know, nausea down, deal with pain um, and deal with anxiety. You know, there's a, especially, you know, the end of life uh, for someone like that is really hard to deal with. Um, so now they're prescribing THC and, you know, I mean, why not? If it helps them, then it helps them. So, yeah, I mean, I think the worst thing in the entire world that could happen in the cannabis industry is, you know, someone who is dealing with cancer and their cannabis is, you know, healing their cancer and then they get listeria from an edible and that's how they actually end up dying. I mean, that would yeah. be a tragic, tragic situation, but it's a situation that we all need to be aware exists. Um, and, and could possibly happen at any point. Yeah. So. You know, you know, it's sad is uh, you being in the food safety world forever and ever and ever, it won't be the person with cancer that dies. That, that's that, that, um, that, that ultimately changes stuff. It's going to be the kid who took it for his, um, or her, uh, epilepsy or whatever and, and dies, uh, that, that in, in America is, is absolutely tragic. And, and that's, that's when things really change, but are you seeing um, on the standard side of stuff, um, what, what do you see the future of cannabis standards are? Do you see something happening for all the states before the federal government gets involved? Or do you see the federal government kind of getting involved and um, ultimately creating like a, a preventive control type of a scenario that we have now with FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act? Or do you kind of see both happening in tandem? states creating standards or some organization creating standards and then adopting to whatever the federal government um, decides to do. Because all, we all know, ultimately, somebody else is going to end up being president uh, and this is going to end up becoming federally legal at some point in time. It's, it's just, it, it's inevitable. Uh, right. But what do you see happening before that? Do you see it just being continued in the wild, wild west or, or are things going to actually change i think that i think that states are gonna realize what's going on um and maybe step up their game first um but then you know once it becomes federally legal then those standards are going to have to be federal standards so no matter what happens on a state level um eventually they'll also have to be held to that higher standard of fda compliance as well um i'm kind of in fear of that day because i know so many i would say like 90 percent of facilities are not up to FDA standards. In fact, a very slim, if even 90% um, amount are. And so when the FDA comes in, you know, a lot of those places are going to get closed, um, could possibly lose their licenses, or could be recalls involved, all, all kinds of things um, could happen. So I'm hoping that um, really it's kind of up to private entity entities right now. Um, you know, like your company with the, you know, food safety standards, I mean, coming up with some kind of standard that we can hold people accountable to that people will sign on to is going to work out um, really, really well. I think for people um, hiring private companies like mine or, you know, I mean, there's several others as well um, to come in and, and deal with your facility and, and make it the way it should be. You know, it's in the hands of the people who own the companies. So if they're going, you know, they decide that they want these standards, they're going to find them and figure out how to get there. Um, before I think any standardization will be put in place. So yeah. um, same with the like the organic seal seals and things like that. There, you know, there isn't any standards like that as well. Um, and there are companies out there, privatized companies that are trying to figure out a way to to make that happen because you know consumers should be concerned about this. This should there should be a public outcry that <laughs> these edibles aren't being regulated. Um, or that, you know, you know, we eat so much organic food in our societies and we're really worried about our health. But, you know, when you go into a dispensary and ask which, which, which strains are organic, literally the bartenders will tell you all of them, which is 100%. <laughs> so, you know, that's the other thing is there's a huge lack of, you know, not like education to even, you know, the people behind the counters and things like that. I mean, there's so many levels of not, you know, just where there needs to be something happening that it's not, um, that I think eventually private entities are going to come in and try to like match those standards or build standards or do something um, to really help the industry. Cause it's up to the industry, how we do, you know, right. and, 
I think eventually the owners of these companies are going to, you know, and that's what I'm seeing. All of my clients are awesome people that have hired my company to make their company the best of the best. And that's, that's the way it should be, you know? Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it really is interesting that that uh, uh, coming from the food safety world, that uh, they're hiring you without any expectation of getting it done correctly. So it, it shows that there is an industry wide uh, desire to be safe for their consumers without having any type of regulatory control telling them to do it, which is which is I, I think is awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, this is one of the best industries ever. Um, hands down. They are, you know, they listen to, you know, what I say and they do what I ask them to do. And it's very, very rare that I find get a lot of pushback because they're just so happy that it's that it's regulated. They're so happy that it's legal. You know, they want to be regulated and they want to be held to those higher standards. And the ones that don't want to be held to those higher standards are the ones that aren't going to make it. Um, right. And they know if they get in early and, you know, get to where they need to be, they're going to they're going to be in there for the long haul. You know, that's just the way it is. That's smart thinking on a business level. Nice. All right. Yeah. Well, um, um, let, uh, let's show people how they can get in contact with you. So um, Weed Whacker Gone <laughs> Consultant, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, if anybody wants to get a hold of Kim to ask her more questions, you can connect with her on LinkedIn. That's how we, we found her um, um, or contact her directly. There's her email address. And she really is one of the top, or if not the top in food safety. I know there's a bunch of companies that I've I've worked with that, that um, um, are interested in having them train train them into consulting for cannabis because there are so many food safety people needed in the cannabis industry. Um, so if you're interested in that, connect with her. She'll be able to help you further. Um, and uh, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So do you have anything else to add before we head out of this webinar? No, I think I'm okay. Um, thank you all for coming and listening to me, you know, blab for a while. <laughs> It was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And um, those, there are people who asked for the slides. We're actually going to be posting this on YouTube probably tomorrow. Um, and, and you also will be receiving, anybody who came on this will be receiving a link where you can go and watch this at any point in time. And uh, I know we'll be putting it on our website. Uh, Kim probably will be putting it on her website. So if you ever need to, to reference this at all, it, it will be there. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much for your time and amazing questions. And if you have any further questions, here's your email address and you can contact with her later. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. No problem. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye.